with a proposal. Uh, for some, it might be a response uh, to the Belt and Road Initiative, but I think it's more of, of a proposal of uh, our place in the world, if I may say so. And what I mean by by we're not the only ones is that we already had the US uh, rather unexpectedly at a G7 meeting announcing what was meant to be actually a, a kind of a you know a joint, uh, although it didn't start that way, a joint proposal, uh, similar proposal to 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 the global gateway, which is the build back better world, and then we had the UK with the clean green initiative. So you know how could the EU not come in a way with with, with its own, and all of that in a way would seem to understate the importance. It's just a following kind of proposal. But I, I actually want to highlight that the proposal as such is, is, is actually quite interesting because it doesn't focus on uh, quantities. So it doesn't, uh, by the way, the, the Build Back Better world is less so because it, that, there isn't even a number which is even comparable to the 300 billion announced uh, by the European Commission, but certainly doesn't come even close to the supposedly large number um, included in funding from China so far in the Belt and Road Initiative. But the whole point is that that's not what Europe wants to do. And I think that's the key, that what Europe wants to do is something which is more focused, although, although the least of items that uh, Europe wants to finance might not be as focused as initially stated because it includes everything, including research. So, you know, it's like health research. It's, it's, it's not as focused as it's claimed to be, but still there's a list of things we want to do. And the other important thing is that it clearly brings together a lot of uh, um, ODI or official development assistance that the EU has already embarked on whether generally or uh, actually more recently with the, with the Team Europe uh, initiative of about 40 billion uh, as a follow, uh, follow up to COVID. So in a way it tries to organize, if I may say, what has already happened, give it, give it coherence, which I think was somewhat lacking and put it in the global map in a way without mentioning, but still, uh, comparing or, or you know bringing it to other initiatives, especially the US one, build back better world, uh, and, and in a way in a more structured way. So that's the good news. But let me move to the slightly less complete so far uh, uh, to me a strategy related to um, the global gateway, and that's the role of the private sector. So um, our dear colleague, Simone Italia Pietra wrote a very nice blog that I recommend to everybody on, on indeed the multiplier. Can, I mean, it, it isn't only about the multiplier, but there is a section of this blog uh, analyzing the global getaway that does go into the multiplier. So how much private money would be needed uh, for this initiative to be successful? I think, what I can bring here to the table based on, on my experience in analyzing the Belt and Road Initiative is that indeed there is this um, mixture of uh, strategic objectives uh, for, I mean, for China in that initiative, but also private sector objectives. Uh, that 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 are embedded in the Belt and Road Initiative, and to my mind, um, this is somewhat less clear in in the pro proposal by the Commission. The one and only thing I can note from that proposal proposal that I find interesting to discuss is the the, the possibilities, not yet a, a certainty, of establishing a European export credit facility. So I do think this is quite an important issue because what we want to do. Or, or so I hope, is to not only to, to make our official assistance more coherent, but actually to bring our private sector into new markets. And I think, and, and, and of course, with the objectives that the commission may have defined, but still bring the private sector. Uh, and I think that's where we need to work more to figure how this strategy could be appealing to the private sector and what kind of seat 
if I may say safe capital or, or support, and again, this export facility could be one, would be needed to that end. So I think that's where we might need to work further uh, on this strategy. And I don't want to extend my comments any further because I'm sure we'll have several rounds. So I leave it here um, to surely hear very interesting uh, views from, from Reinhardt. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Alicia. So, so Reinhard, uh, let's let's turn to you and get your your assessment um, of what the Commission wants to achieve, um, whether it succeeds to achieve it, and you know what's your overall assessment um, in the political context also. Thank you, first of all, for organizing this and um, including me in the conversation. Uh, there's not much at the beginning of this year of which um, I would say that it makes me optimistic, but um, Global Gateway is an exception. I'm pretty uh, optimistic uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the um, strategy has very strong support from member states, in particular from the French, the Germans, the Polish, um, it has a uh, wide ranging support in the European Parliament, also in the business community, Business Europe or BDI have come out strongly in favor. And it has takers, it has partners that are, that can't wait, almost can't wait to get going, uh, partnering with the EU. And what is probably the, the decisive two factors, it now has access to funding, and it has leadership investment. President von der Leyen, when she proposed the Global Gateway Initiative in her State of the Union speech in September, took personal political responsibility, also by giving a name to the baby. This is, of course, not a completely novel endeavor. Already in 2018, the European Union had drafted its connectivity strategy, but that never took off, really. It was a car without wheels. It was a project without um, attractiveness. Um, and I, I recall hearing from the finance minister of Indonesia shortly after this strategy had been published, end of 2018, uh, when she was asked about what she thought about the Belt and Road, she said, well, show me an alternative and I'll tell you what I think about it. At the time, we did not have an alternative. Now we do. So in a way, we learned from China, even though you could argue that connectivity has been part of the EU's DNA forever. Internally, what we did with the European project, with the single market, was creating space for connectivity. Now we're taking this to the global arena. Um, I, um, I want to emphasize that we're not trying to, as, as uh, Alicia already said, we're not trying to get into a arm spending um, contest uh, with the PRC. We're trying to develop our own perspective and of course, we have to deliver, but there are a couple of interesting distinctions between our strategy and uh, what we know from, from BRI. Um, Alicia already mentioned the private sector. In our strategy, the private sector is supposed to be a partner. In the Chinese case of BRI, the private sector is a tool in the hands of the government. In, in our case, we want to uh, allow for market-oriented practices instead of mercantilist policies. In the Chinese case, as we know uh, from uh, analysis by CSIS, more than 85% of all the contracts have gone to Chinese uh, enterprises uh, under BRI. We want to have transparent instead of opaque uh, processes. We want to strengthen sovereignty instead of degrading it. And of course, we do that on the basis of a uh, values-based approach, human dignity and fundamental freedom instead of an autocratic approach. 
I would want to emphasize, and that uh, picks up a point that Alicia already mentioned, that this connectivity strategy is not a standalone thing. Um, it comes in the context of other connectivity initiatives, the Build Back Better World initiative, which is so far just uh, a number of speaking points, uh, but I hope it will materialize. There is still the idea from the Trump administration, the Blue Dot Network. There is the Quad Infrastructure Coordination in the Indo-Pacific, the African Agenda 2063, uh, the Brits have been mentioned, the ASEAN co uh, Connectivity Strategy, the Three Seas Initiative, the Central and Southern Asia Regional Connectivity Initiative. And I think what we should endeavor to do is, from the European side, collaborate with as many partners as possible and with as many connectivity um, projects as possible to create a web of trusted connectivity as Kaush Arha from the Atlantic Council has called it. Um, I believe that there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, we've seen the interest from India and from Japan to forge partnerships with the EU. Uh, we're in the process of trying to have similar partnerships with the African Union and with ASEAN. Um, we uh, certainly will uh, still have to work uh, to um, clarify the governance structure of the strategy. We will have to um, um, work hard to include international financial institutions in helping to roll out uh, the strategy. But um, uh, I, I'm um, as I said, um, uh, of the uh, of the expectation that the commission that um, from the very start talked about acting geopolitically, answering Jean-Claude Juncker's demand that there should be a Weltpolitik Fähigkeit um, has finally found its feet and has found a tool that can help us in developing that. Thank you so much, uh, Reinhard, uh, for these very thoughtful remarks and um, the optimism at the beginning of the year, which I think many of us uh, really appreciate to have some optimism at the at the beginning of the year. Um, now, um, being an economist, um, uh, let me try to unpack and unpick a bit what you said and um, perhaps Note, uh, add a note of pessimism or a question of pessimism, a pessimistic question, let's put it this way, um, and, uh, and push you a bit on, on, on the actual numbers, because um, uh, the term private sector, um, there is a lot of criticism that many economists voice, um, that uh, whenever the Commission and the European Union talks of the private sector, it basically says it doesn't have its own money and hopes that everybody else, uh, especially the private sector, spends, uh, spends the money um, with um, adventurous assumptions about uh, multipliers, um, uh, you know, leveraging, uh, leveraging private sector, sector money with very little public sector money. Now, I, I wonder how you, your, what's your take on, on that issue? Um, how much money is actually on the table? Um, and if you can say, and that's where perhaps I'm perhaps less pessimistic than my question suggests, but I mean, the, uh, I, I did want to ask the pessimistic question because I know that this criticism comes very frequently. Uh, uh, let me add the note of optimism, which is about the fact that of course the European Union um, both um, at the um, union level as well as, as the at the member state level is a much bigger multilateral and bilateral donor to the countries we are talking about uh, than China is. Um, in other words, if you look at the actual numbers, ODA grants, grant equivalent, Europe, Team Europe, is actually investing much more um, in the region um, than, than China does. Uh, it's basically the same number in grants that China does in loans. And we know of, of all the problems that, that China's 
loan policy has that that has been very nicely documented by by Anna Gelpern and and several colleagues um, uh, at Kiel Peterson Institutes and and other institutes uh, across the world. So. So there is an optimism note here that Europe is actually spending already a lot of money. And I, I guess the question is, is that money spent wisely and is it spent strategically and uh, are the dots connected um, or, or aren't they connected? So, so what's your take on sort of this, this set of questions? Well, let me start from the rear end of your question, Guntram. Um, President von der Leyen addressed that in her State of the Union speech when she gave an example. She said, well, just think of this. We have a Chinese-run mine in some African countries and a Chinese-built and Chinese-run harbor, and we're building the road that connects the mine to the harbor. Is that wise investment? And obviously, uh, without much um, further inquiry, I think everybody will agree that this is not the role we should be playing. Um, and indeed, there have been internal discussions about the logic which this new project should follow. And there has been pushback within commission. Uh, DG Intpa, for instance, DG Ener, uh, DG Tran, they were not the, the primary supporters of the connectivity strategy. They tried to block it as best they could. Um, until uh, after a while, the, the president finally um, made up her mind to lead. Uh, um, the, um, the new logic is that we, um, that we want to combine three elements that have been pursued separately in the past. The development cooperation, the um, transformation policy, particularly with regard to climate-related issues, but also digital, and the geopolitical ambitions. And this is the novel, the novel kind of approach. And I don't think that it is um, paramount whether it's really the 300 billion or whether it's uh, 279 or whatever it might end up being, the pro the 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 real issue is that we are creating a new model of policy making, a new approach um, in in shaping our international role as as a European Union, and we are indeed adding new money. The Corepair ambassadors worked hard to make sure that in in the ICI there there is uh, access to funding for uh, connectivity projects. So, so there is now uh, a way of uh, making this come true. And the, um, the involvement of the private sector, as I understand it, is not just meant to sort of put the burden of financing on the private sector. It's, it's meant also uh, in a very practical way as an approach towards co-management. We intend to create a, a, an advisory council uh, that what was already promised in 2018, and now it's gonna, going to happen, which will help identifying worthwhile projects, projects that really make sense in all three dimensions of the policy, development-wise, uh, transformation-wise, and geopolitically. Wonderful. Alicia, do you want to add on that point or also add a question or a remark, please? Yes, I mean, it, I, I, I fully agree that the amount is not everything because uh, there could be a lot of elephant projects and we, we've, you know, we've learned that this has been the case uh, for some of the BRI ones. So, so it doesn't really matter in a way. Um, what matters to the recipient countries is that the projects are sustainable. And, and therefore, I think Reinhardt has a, a, a point there. But I'm now putting myself in the shoes of a European company uh, which sees this global gateway and the reaction of this European company. So say I'm a 
wind turbine uh, company somewhere in Europe. And I want to understand whether this project is going to help me in a nutshell. I mean, I understand that there's other objectives, but from this perspective, um, what the company is going to want to understand is will want to understand is whether what might look as um, uh, unequal footing compared to another wind turbine company from China operating somewhere, um, how, how, how is it going to look like, yeah, for our companies? So is this strategy or the global getaway going to help in reducing the imbalances. And I understand that this is, you know, there's many reasons for this. One could think, you know, one, one part is dumping or, you know, uh, we're not going to deal with those, but some are geopolitical uh, relations with specific governments. Uh, of course, access to funding, although not necessarily the only one, etc. So I think we need to think how this strategy is going to help that private sector so that the private sector comes alone. And in that regard, I think while we may want to identify projects that are, are appealing in, in the three uh, areas that Reinhardt just described, I think the key difference between us and China would be to me to let more room for the private sector to identify those projects. Because that's what makes the whole difference here because that will make them more sustainable uh, in terms of, um, mm you know, return, if I may say, because the private sector has seen that um, that po potential. And I wonder how we can operate that. And that's why I was thinking about some kind of, you know, European level, uh, I don't know, sovereign risk uh, uh, insurance or, you know, something that in a way takes away part of what China is taking away for its companies without major questions, maybe it's not transparent, maybe you, you name it, but it's, it's kind of uh, working for its companies. Yeah, we may not want to emulate the model, but we want to emulate the final outcome, which is that our companies have the very same uh, possibilities to access those markets. So, so that's where I'm coming from uh, here. And I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Can I come back in here? Please, please. Well, um, first of all, I would I would say um, we would be uh, misguided if uh, we would understand uh, the um, um, Global Gateway Initiative as just another export financing tool. Uh, this is not what it's about. Um, I would say it it has to serve two masters, which is as we know from the New Testament. Um, very difficult, uh, but it has to be uh, recipient driven and EU guided at the same time. So we have to go by the development needs and the transformation needs of our partners. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we cannot, uh, just because some wind turbine company wants to sell, well, if that's all they have in mind, well, they can go to Taiwan and try to sell there. I think they have a good market there. But, um, but this is not, the, the private sector logic is not what drives this. What drives this is a political logic. But then the private sector, and there I agree completely with what Alicia said, the private sector comes into play as an actor and not just a tool as a partner, as I said, um, and um, I, I believe that we will have to find ways of practically doing that. And we we're now talking about a strategy that is meant to begin rolling this year, but it's not rolling yet. Um, we we uh, will will have to to invest more thinking into that. But I would be reluctant in trying to base that on some new tool, as, as Alithia uh, mentioned, some investment uh, reassurance or whatever. Uh, I am afraid it might get bogged down if we uh, invest too much work now in, in, in that kind of new development, the new tools. I would rather 
work with the tools that we have, EU-wise, member states level tools, and see how far we get. What do we need to have by the end of the year? We don't need to have 50 projects. We need to have well analyzed, sustainable lighthouse projects in a number of the regions uh, for which we mean this to play a role, meaning Africa, um, Southeast Asia, the Western Balkans, Central Asia maybe. Uh, if we had between three and seven pilot projects by the end of the year that will really fly, I think that would be a great a great start. Um, and then we we will learn by we will learn mm -hmm. by doing. And we, we already have some very practical priorities. Look at the Ella Link uh, deep sea cable that connects Portugal to Brazil. That was built before Global Gateway. But it's an example of what Global Gateway could do. And there would be a very neat project of now connecting Brazil to Angola and including Africa in that uh, data flow uh, network. Um, there is another project, uh, Borel, and, and uh, I think Dombrovskis have mentioned that, 1.5 billion for the development of uh, uh, renewable energy in the north of Africa. So I think some of the projects are very plausible already. But, but Reinhard, can I push you a bit on the political side further and on the recipient country's perspective in particular? I mean, um, the title of our event today is Global Gateway versus Belt and Road Initiative. And you mentioned, I think, the Indonesian <laughs> finance minister, who, if I uh, heard you say correctly, um, said, well, what's the alternative um, to the Belt and Road Initiative? And I mean, in a sense, if I was a minister and I uh, of a, such an emerging economy and I had my my airport and my my port uh, or my airport and my factory be funded by by China, of course, um, I would very much like to get complementary funding for the road in between. And if I don't get that, um, you know, um, what, uh, what is it that I want to get? And so so. Um, so, so in a sense, what I'm trying to understand is, I mean, how much will it, will this be complementary to Chinese efforts and how much will it be uh, sort of a real alternative to, to, Chinese, to Chinese lending? And you also said, um, well, we start with a few small projects um, that are well designed. And I agree that this I is- I say small. Okay, I'll let's say, say we, start, we start with a few projects that are well designed. And that's of course correct from a from a project perspective. But if you want to have political influence, even in the Balkans, I mean, if you just have one project, I mean, it's probably not going to be enough to to really become an alternative to 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 Chinese offerings. So, so how do you see the politics politics of this play out, in particular from the point of view of the recipient countries? Well. Again, I, I think the credibility of this new initiative has to be built. There is interest, but uh, by no means have we demonstrated that we can pull it off and that it will indeed be advantageous, that it will create more business and more jobs for the local economies, mm. for, as one example. That it will be more transparent and less corrupt than, than some of the Chinese projects are. That it will not end up with debt dependency, as we saw in the Montenegro case. Um, I think we should, uh, we should have a clear, uh, a clear geo a set of geographic priorities. Um, the Western Balkans is, should be a priority. Uh, I have already mentioned uh, Africa. I know that commission has been analyzing connectivity corridors that would make sense uh, uh, between the EU and, uh, and Africa. And uh, for instance, China is building data centers in some African countries. 
maybe it might be a good idea to also offer from the European side building some data centers in some other countries, just to make sure everybody understands you don't have to turn to Beijing if you want to invest in in uh, digital uh, connectivity. And if we can deliver on that successfully, success sells, I would um, I would argue. Um, that... Um, that I am uh, pretty, um, pretty optimistic, uh, pretty optimistic about. The, the, another dimension is by creating good technical standards, we're also uh, supporting countries that may not even buy into our own offers, but would be... Um, capacitated would be empowered to look at what China offers with a more um, more well-balanced set of criteria. The Japanese have been pushing hard for an agenda of high quality infrastructure. What the Chinese have been doing hasn't always met these criteria. Uh, some of the stuff is uh, low quality with regard to sustainability, for instance. They have invested so much money into coal technology, as an example. Now they promise they won't in the future. We'll see. But uh, to to create um, uh, high technical high technical standards and to deliver on those standards, that will be uh, that will be certainly important, and it will give China an idea. Uh, sorry, uh, recipient countries an idea of what they should look for, even when they negotiate with the Chinese. That's right. Okay, we are already getting a lot of questions. Actually, we have 14 questions that have arrived here. Some, are, of course, um, complementary to each other. So I, if you agree, uh, uh, Reinhard, I would bundle three questions always uh, so that we, we get, uh, get uh, as many questions as possible in. Um, the first question is by Brit, uh, Brit Hecht on the geographical coverage um, and the comparison between Global Gateway and uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and in particular, what place has Latin America in the Global Gateway um, Initiative? Um, our colleague Andre Sapir is asking about the role of IFIs, so the World Bank, Asian African Development Banks, AIIB, um, and others. Um, how, how does that fit in? Um, and Nora. Um, South Mikat is asking, can Europe be a forerunner to realize a high quality infrastructure alongside a binding treaty, legally binding instruments on, corp on corporations to respect human rights? Um, so, so these are the three um, initial questions and perhaps um, Reinhard, you wanna give it a go and Alicia, you complement then. Okay, geographic. Um reach. Uh, the original connectivity strategy of 2018 uh, looked only at the Eurasian arc. This new Global Gateway Initiative has, as the name already says, a global perspective. Uh, but uh, we're not promising to do everything at the same time. There, uh, there are clearly priorities. Uh, priorities are defined by the connectivity partnerships that we have already established, like with the Japanese established in September 2019 and with uh, India established last year. Um, and also, um, we have a, a shared ministerial meeting, had a, a, a such a, a shared ministerial statement with uh, ASEAN um, last year or, or year before last, I don't quite recall, uh, there is the interest uh, with, um, with um, Africa and, and President Macron just uh, the other day uh, put this in the context of resilient supply chain management uh, also. Uh, I think that's a, a good context. So uh, Latin America is certainly there, but Latin America is at the moment not, as far as I can see, not at the forefront. As far as I know, we're not negotiating with a Latin American partner at the moment about such a connectivity partnership, but things could change. 
Uh, Mr. Sapir asked for IFIs. Um, I, I shortly mentioned that we should strive to um, bring them on board. The Chinese have uh, signed uh, tons of memorandums of understanding with all kinds of institutions, including IFIs, to further their BRI strategy. And I think we should do just the same. But we, in order to be able to do that, we first have to show that we can stand on our own feet and then bring the IFIs on board, I would say. And Nora's question, can we, if I get your question right, Nora, it is, can we be a forerunner in high quality infrastructure uh, investment and human rights at the same time? And um, I would say not in every single case and not in every single instance. Uh, if uh, if uh, a government is run by an autocrat who hates nothing more than human rights, probably this is not um, a promising um, circumstance. But there, uh, I think we should um, we should focus on um, um, important transformation countries, um, countries like um, South Africa, countries like uh, Indonesia, for instance. Um, um, where we have some uh, some um, commonalities, uh, also value, values wise, uh, and um, and we'll we'll have to we'll have to take lessons from mm -hmm. from the mistakes that we're certainly going to make. Uh, but, but no uh, conditionality. I mean, shouldn't there be some degree of conditionality if there's a major grant um, uh, making it conditional at the corporate level, at least on the respect of human rights? Um, well, we have not yet seen any um, final results of such deliberations within commission. To what degree there should be conditionality? As far as I know, that, that has not um, panned out yet. Um, I think there should be a, a generic conditionality, indeed. Uh, how you organize this, uh, I would uh, refrain from commenting on that. I would think that people who have more experience than I have with development cooperation should give us advice on how to do that. Got you. Alicia, do you want to compliment? Um... Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, very quickly compliment, but actually go back to this difficult trade-off uh, between the private sector and the ultimate geopolitical roles, if I may, by using an example uh, which relates to Japan and actually Indonesia and China. So on the on the queries, I think the one and only thing I'd like to add is that uh, the BRI is as global, if not more global than, than what we're intending to do. So there's no such thing in a way. And I think that wasn't the very beginning of the strategy where we had six corridors and the, the countries mentioned in the six corridors were I think something like 36 or, or the like, and they ended up being 150 plus. Uh, why? Because the whole idea was the more global it becomes, the better it is, because it's a, indeed a global. So I think we've learned that lesson, as Reinhardt mentioned, and we've followed through by making this indeed a global strategy, because you cannot really tell whether geography is the most important thing, I mean, neighborhood and so on, to determine the importance of a project uh, for connectivity in, in a more broad in a broader sense. So I fully agree that, that a global strategy is better. I wanted to, to, to highlight that. And um, I think uh, going back to the issue of the private sector, which I think is, is very important, um, I, I, I think this example that I'm going to offer, uh, which relates to uh, basically an offer by both China and Japan to the Indonesian government in September 20, 2015 for the construction of a rail link, um, which basically reduced massively the time, uh, connection time between Jakarta and uh, West Java, uh, West Java city, Bandung, which the Japanese lost. And and, and this, this brings me to, to, to your question, you know, it's like the recipient side, what does the recipient want? 
because we may think the recipient wants sustainable projects and transparency and you name it, but maybe they also have other objectives. Yeah, I mean, they, they would very much like to have all of that plus something that we might not be able to measure. And one important um, reason, which is just rumorology, but I want to mention why Indonesia eventually decided to uh, for China was not even the cost, which by the way, is an issue for many and might be an issue for us because again, going back to my point, Chinese companies may have better funding or cheaper funding or you know you name it and that that is something we need to think about how how to be able to compete but the the rumors were that uh and this is uh, andre's question actually that aiib uh promised a secondary site to in jakarta which so far has not been delivered whether this is true or not i don't know but but it makes the point i want to make that there is a lot of st st more structural strategic issues that countries may negotiate or may be dealing with when, when discussing a big project. And the question is, how are we going to handle that? Because we are offering a totally different setup. We want a transparent, uh, again, value-driven maybe, you know, and possibly and, and long list of stuff, yeah? which might not necessarily be what the recipient has in mind. So if we make it such that right. we don't even, I say even, offer some kind of tool for the private sector beyond the existing ones, uh, then we know now that um, they've not made it very far so far. Yeah, I mean, if we look at the major projects, infrastructure projects of the last, say, decade, we know where we stand. So I think we should also start by thinking what is missing for us to be there? And are, is it what we are offering, what will make us be there? And I agree with Reinhardt right. that we need to start with a few projects, but I think these questions need to be reflected upon before we even start. Because we may be offering A, the countries want B. Do we want to offer B? Maybe not, but then how are we going to do it? Yeah, that's, right. that's I mean, the point. I think if you allow me to add another example, Guntram, a couple of years ago, when they, um, in Malaysia, surprisingly, Prime Minister Mahathir was elected over his extremely corrupt predecessor, one of the first measures he took was to tell China that some of the uh, infrastructure investment projects that had been agreed between the two countries would be on hold because he felt they were overly advantageous to China and not giving a fair deal to his own country. At the time I spoke to represent, uh, one of the projects was a high-speed rail connection, uh, I think between uh, Malaysia and uh, Singapore, if I'm not uh, mistaken. At the time I spoke to um, officials of the EU, to uh, uh, officials from business and asked, would we be in a position to offer an alternative to Mahathir? We were not. This is what I think we should be able to do. I would guess in this particular context, when he won his election over issues of corruption, insisting on high standards of transparency would not have been detrimental to our project. But can we muster the strength to make a, a, an, an offer? We didn't. Uh, he, he negotiated successfully with the Chinese and got a better price for the projects and they're back in business. But in the future, we should be able to compete there. Right. I mean, I, I, see, I see that as a very nice positive example, but of course, you can also construct uh, a very easily uh, the opposite example where um, uh, a leadership change from a more democratic, transparent to a, less, a more autocratic um, uh, uh, leader is occurring, um, and then um, uh, you know imposing or becoming uh, offering the EU offering itself as an alternative to the Belt and Road Initiative might be much less less attractive um, to that that government. So, so and and that's very much the spirit of some of the questions we are getting here. I mean, so there's a, the question: Isn't there a contradiction between? 
recipient countries logic and and EU values logic. Um, there was also a question here on on climate change and you know whether whether or not this can be used, this instrument can be used to um, uh, foster um, green infrastructure and make sure that that it's happening uh, and uh, being done done more quickly. Um, I think it's a question here by Peter Peter Zeep in, in Frankfurt, um, who talks about electric trains um, uh, that emit less CO two than than trucks and buses, for example. Um, and um, and then there is another question which is also in the same sort of direction, so so um, which is about security, national security. Is the Build Back Better and the Global Gateway just a guise to engage in national security objectives to counter, counteract BRI, or is it a legitimate positive policy? And um, last but not least, um, uh, there was a question about, um, now I'm lost now here in so many questions. Um, uh, but but I think I think the spirit is really I mean this this in, this balancing act between wanting to influence and shape things in our way and on the other hand sometimes domestic politics that might go exactly in the in the other direction and how how do we get this this balancing act act right um, any any further thoughts on this kind um, well look if 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 uh, participants earnestly ask whether I can guarantee that there will be no political or economic contradictions in such a, a major project. The answer obviously is no, I cannot promise. But uh, when has it ever been an argument that a policy that we uh, want to develop has to deal with contradictions. That's how the world is contradictory. <laughs> and so our, if, right. if our policy promises not to uh, uh, tackle contradictions or to deal with contradictions, then we should be wary of such a promise. Uh, obviously, um, uh, there, there could be ways of, of, of bungling this. But I've just uh, seen a study that has been done um, in the context of asking for um, climate-oriented foreign policy uh, done by Jennifer Tolman and others that say that the Global Gateway Initiative could be a perfect tool that could be used to promote this transformation strategy. Wh whoever's interested should send an email and I'll share the study. Um, also, uh, I, I wonder what, what the, the sense is of the question, whether something is um, pursuing a national uh, security objective or else is legitimate. Uh, I would consider national security concerns to be quite legitimate. Uh, we live in it, but to answer that more seriously, uh, we live in a world in which geopolitical issues trump geoeconomic issues. That is what China has taught us. And we cannot be successful if we insist on playing a, games, a game according to rules that do not find consensus from other important players anymore. Uh, we used to be of the uh, conviction that our geo economic logic uh, would have a transformative effect also on the Chinese players. Wandel durch Handel. It didn't turn out that way. Uh, so now we're being changed if we don't uh, watch out uh, by uh, our economic uh, investment in China. Some have put so many eggs into just one basket that they're making themselves vulnerable. Um, I think this I is a very much the way I put it. Yeah, sorry. I, I believe that uh, trying to pursue an economic strategy that does not integrate the national security perspective is faulty. Yeah, I think it's a very realpolitik um, assessment that you bring up to the table here. And I think that's really important and welcome in a sense. Um, 
and welcome that it comes from a green politician also um, that uh, I think is, a, is an important uh, message um, to, uh, to the political system. I want to ask you one last question, which is also from the audience and which is again a bit more concrete, which is about the Western Balkans. Um, and you know, what scope do you see very concretely um, for this uh, initiative to, um, to make a difference in, in the Western Balkans, given all the politics that is at play there and given all the, let's say, um, uh, hurt feelings, um, uh, the um, failed accession process, um, and so on and so forth. And of course, the major Chinese investments that are happening now and that are offering themselves as concrete alternatives um, to, to the European Union. What can we do um, con very concretely in, in the main countries of the Western Balkans? Well, we are doing a lot already. My good friend Elmar Brook once um, approached commission uh, because he had been infuriated about state by a statement of the president of Serbia uh, uh, praising his brother and um, comrade Xi Jinping um, for um, helping Serbia during the pandemic. And Elmar said to commission, please tell me what are the Chinese really doing in Serbia and what are we doing? And it took commission, I think, four days to come up to cough up the facts. And it turned out we were way outperforming uh, Serbia, uh, in Serbia, outperforming China, but nobody had collected the information. I think that is something we have to learn. The Chinese overpromise and underdeliver, and we overdeliver and uh, don't talk about it. Uh, we're we're too shy there. Uh, that is that is one thing. The the other element, I think we need. Um, national ownership of this strategy. This is why I emphasize the support from member states. Um, look at the, the Polish and their three C's initiative. If we don't get them on board because we show to them that this Global Gateway Initiative and their three C's initiative, which also focuses on infrastructure development, can work hand in hand, then it will be very difficult because it could be seen as a Brussels effort to counter that regional integration perspective. Uh, we shouldn't be foolish enough to allow that. And uh, of course, there are some, uh, some criteria, for instance, in the energy sector, until just recently, China has still pushed for investing into dirty coal in the Balkans. Uh, now they, as I said, they promise to to move away from that. We'll still uh, have to wait and see, but clearly we have the uh, um, the obligation to offer alternatives. And frankly, Commission has understood that even before the Global Gateway Initiative, um, Commission has promised a large investment package for the Western Balkans because they realize if we don't do that, we'll lose, be losing the Western Balkans. Wonderful. I, I think that was a um, very clear answer. And I think we had an extremely rich uh, discussion and we also had excellent questions from a very engaged audience. So let me thank you, uh, Reinhard Bütikofer, very much for uh, your time today. And uh, let me also thank you, Alicia, for um, bringing your perspective um, from uh, Asia uh, to this conversation. And again, th a big thanks to the audience for being so engaged with us in this event, which was actually, I think, the first uh, event of Bruegel of this year. So thank you so much. And until next time, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Alicia.